Collaboration, platforms and tools for inclusivity. So, and uh, welcome back in the studio. Who writes, produces and distributes stories and about whom? And who may watch or can watch? Building an inclusive and just audiovisual industry is a collective effort. From storytelling to production and distribution to access, how are independent initiatives helping bring representation on screen and with it also the industry forward? And uh, with me, I have three guests. Very unfortunately, Senet Debezi, the CEO and founder of uh, Greta and Starks, is not able to uh, join us today. I um, uh, wish her all the best and uh, get well soon. Um, this is unfortunate because she has a great tool uh, with Greta and Stark. So I encourage every of you who is interested, maybe Melissa in the chat can uh, put the link so that uh, people can uh, get to that. That would be really great. So I welcome here with me Faryat Faryat oh, Faraz Shariat. I'm sorry, it's the end of the day. <laughs> Faraz, thank you to be there, the director, uh, uh, director and from the Junglinger Collective. Um, Roisin Taponi, the founder of Shasha Movies and Habibi Collective and Donald Young, the Director of Programs, the Center for Asian American Media. And I will start with you, uh, Faraz Shariat, as a representative of a production. Let's start with production, right? With Jungling. So tell <laughs> us briefly, maybe, uh, who is Jungling and uh, how are you working for more authentic representation and inclusion at Jungling? Um. Yeah, I mean, Junglinger is a collective uh, that we founded, I think, almost six years ago. So we studied cultural studies, um, so we have a very um, theoretical background in terms of like how we approach filmmaking. We always try to like ask ourselves why we are doing something before we do ask ourselves what we are doing. Um, and uh, we basically um, have a collective infrastructure of producing and developing um, content, which is uh, has in a way to do, I think, with uh, sharing responsibilities, but also trying to um, yeah make a point uh, in terms of like empowering other people uh, who want to work on their uh, film projects that are um, somehow um, coming from anti-racist, queer and feminist perspectives, because that's the intersections of those and more, um, yeah, I think diverse uh, identities is what we really try to focus on. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically like in a nutshell what we are currently trying to do here in um, Germany. And we yes. also like most of us, like we work as creatives and we also work as a production company. So we have like two roles at the same time. Okay. And uh, how many people are in this collective? Um, it's three at its heart. Um, Raquel Mold, Paulina Lorenz and me. Um, we... Um, yeah, we work on it every day. And then there are like a lot of collaborators that we work on project by project or um, that we just got to know. Um, so it's a very, um, yeah, I think it, it, in total, we're like 10 to 15 people maybe. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. For those of, who, of you who do not know the film, there is the Future Dry in Germany, uh, No Hard Feeling in English, uh, which is uh, now um, in the virtual cinemas, at least um, uh, moving on. So maybe you can have a look at the, at the trailer after this session, right? We're going to stay on it now. So I turn to uh, Roisin Taponi. You have also a double role as Habibi Collective and now Shasha Movie. And um, you once said about uh, Habibi Collective as a digital platform 
an archive placing independent filmmakers from Southwest A Asia and North Africa gaining traction early on because of people seeing themselves being represented. So how did you do that first with the Habibi Collective? Uh, so Habibi Collective is basically a, uh, um, I still struggle to kind of uh, really pin, pin down what it is, but a digital archive, a curatorial platform, podcast, um, and uh, and I guess movement for uh, women, for the filmmaking of uh, women and non-binary folk from Southwest Asia, North Africa, or uh, Middle East, North Africa. Um, and what I found at the beginning, I mean, a lot of projects are kind of concept led now, but it really came from a place of me uh, just watching lots of movies uh, for like 10 years, just like really kind of heavy researching. And then I remember watching a, a film, a moving image uh, essay film uh, by Mona Hatoum called Measures of Distance. And that really struck a chord for me because um, so I'm a Syrian, which is an indigenous eth ethnic group to Iraq, and I lived in Ireland for a long time, and now I'm in London. So I was I was really finding through her film, a, it, it being in the kind of also filmed in London and having that diasporic position, I could identify with experiences that I was not seeing on the on in mainstream cinema. Uh, so that really propelled me to start doing more research uh, and just telling people in my community because uh, everything for me is community led everything is collaboratively led um, and I speak to my community first and foremost so just doing small screenings um, for friends <laughs> um, and uh, and then having really it felt really radical and and uh, and people you know how just having hour-long conversations after and then I started the Instagram page and uh, and I realized that a lot of people were not necessarily uh, engaging with the page because they were film buffs, but because they were uh, women from the region and then and they were seeing themselves represented in these um, in these films. And uh, the thing about a lot of films by women and, and non-binary folk in the region is that they're not actually accessible, like they're very hard to, to watch. Um, so a lot of the way that I access them was through stills and long form captions, um, which is, you know, very suited to Instagram. Um, and then, yeah, and then I guess, you know, just it was completely organic. There was no business plan, no marketing, no like paying for ads or anything. I think just lot, lots of women just kind of, um, took to it. Um, and then as I started to do more screenings, um, it started to grow. And then obviously now there's the there's the streaming platform. Um, you mean the, so sh sh sorry, the streaming platform, you mean the Shasha movies, right? Yeah, Shasha. So uh, Shasha is Arabic for screen. Uh, and it's the first, uh, the first independent streaming service for uh, Middle East, North African or Southwest Asian, North African cinema. Wonderful. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, wonderful. For the, I'm not finished with you. I will come back to you. But uh, now I want to turn to uh, Donald, uh, Donald Yang. You, as a, as a director of programs at the Center for uh, Asian America uh, Media, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to presenting stories that convey the diversity and richness of Asian American experience to the broadest audience possible. So you have a role as a producer. You have worked both in documentaries and also in independent feature films, including the five hour PBS history series, Asian Americans. And uh, maybe the first question um, uh, for you, uh, uh, Donald, would be how can you as a producer tell us how to secure financial and creative autonomy to tell authentic story? How do you see this? What would you recommend? Sure. So briefly, the organization I work for, Center for Asian American Media, where located in the US in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we were founded in 1980, specifically um, to, to provide opportunities for Asian American stories and Asian American producers to tell our stories. So last year we came out with this five part historical series, Asian Americans. It took us uh, about eight years to, to put it together. We produced it with a, a PBS station, WIDA uh, in the US. Um, and it was a real learning experience for us, you know, the opportunity to tell our story and our history as the pandemic was, um, you know, uh, surging around the world. Uh, people of Asian descent have been suffering because of that. But, you know, I think being able to put that project together um, 
the power of um, uh, bringing a team politically and building generations was important. You know, I think uh, that experience indicated to us really the difficulties in terms of um, putting a, 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 an ambitious project like that together. You know, it was hard uh, for an all Asian American team initially to put the financing together. You know, for year for decades, you know, efforts have been attempted to put something like this together. But, you know, it turns out we really needed uh, a, an established station partner, non-Asian American in PBS in the U.S. in order to make this happen. And I think it was, you know, coming at a time when there's a lot, as people have been talking about on these panels, a certain kind of reevaluation of where our industry is and how power and class comes into play. But, you know, packaging it, um, getting the financing, it was difficult. I expect uh, in the future from this moment on, there's going to be a lot more sensitivity to who's telling the story and how projects get put together. But it was a very heavy lift over the last eight years. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting point to have an ally with a broadcaster, for example, right? I mean, that is something that uh, you also are experiences, um, uh, um, uh, Faraz? Um, no, I mean, in my case, it was a bit tricky because we've tried financing the film. Um, I think for three years and worked together with the broadcaster, but um, then parted again after like a one year collaboration of developing it. And that was like a very dramatic and I think tragic low point of the whole process of making this film. And we ended up shooting it with, I think, 200,000 or maybe 180,000 euros, which is really, yeah, not a lot. And um, I think that had to do with the lack of experience. Most of us were doing film for the first time and we didn't really have a track record, but also obviously for um, a lack of um, yeah, uh, eagerness and ambition from financing sites, like whether it's funding institutions or broadcasters um, to commit to this project. Um, we had like a really difficult time, especially like uh, there are uh, regulations in terms of like how much German language do you need to have in the film so that it's labeled as German and in our film it's like 60% in Farsi, which is the language spoken in Iran and it's just... Yeah, it's just it's tricky to translate that into the reality of um, film funding when it is so um, national uh, as it is in many European countries and especially in Germany. Um, yeah, I'm sure it is not yeah. only in Germany, uh, Faraz. I'm sure that uh, to uh, challenge the conventional modes uh, of funding and criteria and etc. are certainly um, all over the places uh, necessary. You, you need to, to shuttle the, I don't know, like the system, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, talking about Moving on with the with the system, uh, Rosine, uh, you are actually uh, challenging conventional modes of distribution, and I wanted to know maybe from your point of view how curation and independent streaming services such as Shasha Movies can help improve the cultural landscape of the audiovisual industry. How do you see your role there? Uh, well, I think the I, I started to think about I guess radical pedagogies of how distribution could work um, through COVID. Um, so I directed Iraq's first uh, independent film festival, and it early in COVID, and it really. Um, and it was the time when Cannes was kind of deferred, and like all of these major film festivals were sort of a, I guess publicly like struggling. Um, and I was like, you know, how can we center access, slowness and care um, towards these filmmakers? So, you know, just kind of, a, of I would, um, I, I, I don't know, I, can't I, I did things like, uh, for example, waiving the need for a screening fee and actually paying MGs or, or screening fees, uh, sorry, waiving the need for an entry fee and, and paying screening fees to the filmmakers that we showed and, um, and having everything in dual language with Iraqi uh, and uh, Kurdish, um first uh, and then english and then um and then mil like loads of other things so um uh, having it no geo blocking so everyone in the world uh, is able to watch was able to watch the film festival for free um and yeah and and you know and just kind of figuring out ways like this where where access can be centered um and with shasha 
what I found very interesting was how there's so much discourse, especially theoretical discourse around the politics of space. And when we traditionally think about radical cinema, we, we tend to think about either like the factory as location, or we think of any sort of alternative grassroots space. Uh, and there's so much conversation on this, but I found it very interesting, how especially in reaction to movements like Black Lives Matter, suddenly every institution was screening a high, highly political films on Silicon Valley hosting services. So I was like, how, you know, how do I navigate that? So that's why it was really important to me to build Shasha, to code it from scratch, uh, which I did with, um, cause I do some coding as well with a, with a few other, uh, with a few tech people. Um, so that was, you know, just carving a digital space, I think, and a digital footprint is, is also really important. And I guess carries on the legacy of Heavy B Collective, which, you know, kind of gained momentum on Instagram. Um, so yeah, so Shasha, uh, I don't know if you want me to uh, go briefly into it, but it's a, a sure. it's a streaming service for um for like both uh, for for it's all all genders um and uh, it's not just women uh, and non-binary focus as is um a heavy B collective. So basically, I'm working with men for like <laughs> the first time, um and uh, that is uh, that yeah. So that's kind of one main difference, uh, and also um. It is essentially, you know, it's a it's a it's a business because transactions are involved. It's an SVOD service. Uh, so I want to keep that different to Heavy B Collective as well, which is at its core, just a lot more fluid uh, and uh, and everything else. So I uh, each month, me and uh, two programmers who I trained and now work alongside me, uh, I trained them for a year. They uh, we, we curate 20 different films uh, responding to different um, social, political, whatever discourses. Um, so this month we're screening Yemen's new wave of cinema because I was on the jury for a Yemeni film festival last year and there's a really emerging industry there. And next month we're screening um, women's uh, guerrilla political documentaries from 1970s to 2019 and um, from films throughout, throughout the region. Mainly, though, I think there's a lot of North African films. Um, so, yeah, and then it's there's no geo blocking, uh, which is really, um, I think, yeah something that distributors do not like. <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely. <laughs> That's revolutionizing the thing. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, do, can you tell me um, how many percent of documentaries do you have on the on the uh, streaming platform? Oh, it's mostly documentaries. It, I'd mostly. say like, yeah, in the, maybe like 18 out of, well, for, yeah, maybe like 18 out of 20 films per month. Okay. Um, because uh, a lot of films, I think, in the region don't, especially when we're talking about women's films or, or films by people who are marginalized for, you know, whatever whatever reason, um, there is not the access to funding. So people can't really make commercial narrative feature lengths that get theatrical releases, uh, whether they, they, you know, whether they want to or not, it's not really a feasible option. Um, right. So women traditionally have tended to make documentaries and especially the more political work, which uh, we tend to gear to, uh, to focus on. Um, obviously, it's not going to be like state funded or anything. And there's not there's not really great funding systems in place anyway. So, uh, so I think that's, it's more kind of material conditions to do with politics, economics, and, and kind of, and uh, gender discrimination, um, mm -hmm. that means that the documentaries get made. Right. Um, Donald, I mean, I, I actually, I invited you actually, because I read a fantastic article you wrote, and you were saying, if I may quote and ask you a question on this, um, join the conversations. Engage directly with BIPOC communities. There are many organizations and networks ready to strategize around today's pressing social conversations. Demonstrate a proactive commitment and actively initiate. Allocate appropriate resources to compensate for expertise. So, Donald, what, what would you actually recommend to, to a producer, to a broadcaster or distributor? What, what is your, your recommendation there to make a, a next step? into more um, authentic representation. Sure. Well, that, that was part of a Ford Foundation provocation that I was asked to write um, towards the fall of last year. I, I think as all of we on the panel are talking about this moment, you know, I think on the one hand, folks have been indicating that 2020 was the beginning of a reckoning. But in other ways, you know, for those of us who have been doing this work for decades, perhaps this moment is an opportunity, right? Where, where 
new strategies, new moral, new codes of ethics, uh, and new ways of working can be constructed in a way that are both more equitable, but 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 turn out with better storytelling and, and sort of that the lived experience is one important way in which stories can be told uniquely. Right? I think for the work that I do for the organization I'm a part of, CAM, that that that's what we've always been committed to. I think the last two years has been an awful lot of opportunities in top in, in terms of prompting a reconsideration of how our field can work. I, I think for CAM, for the work that I do, it's not just for our uh, our filmmaking community, but really I, I think pushing our industry to rethink its values, not 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 just for the better of ourselves, but for how we all tell stories, right? And I think it's as important in front of as behind the camera. You know, for us, the work, you know, we, we're just as excited about the teams that we build, the ways in which we work, as we are about the stories we're trying to tell, right? So I think there's um, a rich opportunity. Uh, you know, we're, we're part of a lot of these, uh, you know, beyond inclusion, other entities that I'm proud to be a part of are really trying to push the conversations forward in terms of rethinking how we work. You know, I think as we always allude to, there's there are finite resources in the field of documentary. But the last few years has seen a certain kind of unleashing of commercial uh, potential, which, you know, perhaps has widened the gaps in terms of what 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 uh, filmmakers have um the opportunities they have access to, and we want to call that out and really make sure that that that, that the field is committed as a whole to, to to advancing the interests of more stories being told. Absolutely. So uh, it's interesting because I mean there have been a, a lot of social um, uh, uh, movements. Black Lives Matter. You were evoking Rosine, but also um, um, uh, Me Too and um, uh, also COVID and. Uh, all these uh, waves stronger than we are actually uh, obliging us to rethink the way we work, the way we attribute resources, the way we give access. And uh, I would like to say, I don't know who is we right now, um, but um, the, the way to rethink the system. This is why we have also called this conference reset and redistribute and etc. etc. One thing is I hear everywhere. Diversity is trending and i use very consciously this word trending right platforms spaces and tools look inclusive but they do actually strengthen inclusion and allow authentic representation question mark and this is a question for uh, all of you maybe uh, starting with you faraz um do you think it is actually strengthening inclusion and allow authentic representation or is it just exist uh, allow to um, um, uh, existing power structures to operate something like mainstreaming diversity so to speak or even diversity washing how do you see this as a, as a producer yeah and i think it's a really yeah i think i think it's a really interesting question and something that i'm still like trying to um understand uh, when i first started to um yeah i don't know just like release no hard feelings which was my debut feature film as a director um, I was like um, experiencing so much positive feedback, whether it's economically or um, critically and economically more through the projects that I then got um, submitted. But it's it's um, and I was very much, I think, on this um, in this on this mindset of, wow, there are so many opportunities. There are so many people who are interested in my perspective. But then I somehow like now a year and a half later, I feel like I'm very cautious when it comes to um, this whole like um, fra phrasing it as change. I think like this idea of things changing and um, uh, it has never been the time like today. Diversity is such an important thing for us all and we understand the political reality of it and so on. I just feel like it's, 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 it's just a mechanism that keeps myself like um interacting with a system that is in itself rotten <laughs> and it's like I, I i think it's a very like difficult thing because it's super I, I don't think it's 
possible to operate outside a system that you live in. But I, I do think it's, it's very important to portion your energy and ask yourself, how much time am I um, investing into creating a change that is fictional or that is maybe more catering to people who are serving, uh, who, are, who are profiting from a system. And um, sometimes I ask myself, is it not better to invest my time into creating um, content that I find uh, is empowering or to empowering other people? Um, and it's also about, I think, this question of uh, when working artistically or as a producer, deciding which content you push. It's a really a question of, like, do you go for narratives that simply like address the reality of marginalization of oppression of like make space for the violence that partly makes us who we are or do you try to find stories that um, create a space that um, inspires and carves out the potential especially when talking about fiction and storytelling of other ways like who we can be i like I just asking yourself like, um, like just asking myself, like, what would I be and what would I like? What would I like hate if, uh, if racism wasn't a thing, for example? It's just a question that opens up so much resource and so much energy for that, that I want to like work towards, if that makes sense. Um, totally. I am following yeah. you totally, especially because, I mean, for those of you who are not, I mean, I, I happen to live in Germany, in, 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 in Berlin, and um, Future Dry, I mean, um, No Hard Feelings, has been really like totally hyped as the future of cinema, the new cinema, the new film, the way to consider new ways to consider uh, social uh, questions and etc. So I can totally follow this um, questioning you have with yourself, like, what is this? What do we do with this? But at any case, you started a movement <laughs> with this, and uh, and uh, there has been a lot of visibility on this. So uh, I turn now to Roisin to ask the question, the same question: Do do you see there is a, a, a nowadays a mainstreaming diversity or or diversity washing from your end? How do you experiment this with uh, your uh, from your point of view? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, definitely women's films from the region have become trendy in the past. Um, in the, I'd say in the past only like two, three years. Um, and that's a huge change because they were not cool before. Um, but now, you know, there's, that's not necessarily a negative thing. I think in terms of filmmakers, it get it, it brings more money to for women to like make commercial narrative feature lengths. Uh, and we see filmmakers like, um, I don't know, Haif al Mansour or, um, or, you know, especially Gulf women filmmakers kind of act, having access to this. Um, but at the same time, um, yeah, it's, it, I can talk from different positions, but even running the streaming service, obviously then I'm competing with um, Netflix and I'm competing with Mubi and I'm competing with all of these other um, streaming platforms with a lot more money than I have um, because we, um, we, opposite, op we operate 100% independently. Um, and that's difficult because a lot of the time distributors um, are not actually, uh, not Arab or not, uh, or not you know, or wider from the region um so you know if like i find a lot of the time like if i'm trying to get a film made by someone from the region and i go to this distributor and i say well i only have x amount to offer you but you know the whole point of this project is actually to bring films back to the people they're actually made about and they're made for um, because a lot of the time these films just get circulated in basically like white European or, or like uh, American US audiences and don't actually get shown back home. So yeah. that's the, the the kind of point of, of, of the streaming service. And uh, and a lot of the time, you know, these European distributors, they don't care. It, you know, they don't care about the sort of ethics or the morals, whatever. It's just like who can offer the most money. Um, so really trying, you know, that's a struggle as a sort of um, programmer. Um, and also, you know, considering documentary within its kind of essay film slash moving image form within art industries, which I also am very active in, um, I think I realized very early on that my role in these institutions was to fulfill some sort of diversity quota um, and, uh, and, you know, to bolster their own you know, diversity inclusion policy rather than to kind of, it was representational basically. I felt like a lot of the film, the, my presence there and the presence of these programs was 
um, you know, representational politics. And I think I think it's more systemic. And I think we need to look towards changing structures. Um, and yes, yeah, because the, the problem is systemic, not representational. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these places need, sorry, these places need uh, us more than we need them. And that was a huge realization for me. Um, no, when this is talking. absolutely great. No, no, no. I, I, I'm. I, I know we're running out of time, but I mean, I'm, I'm totally uh, into what you're saying right now. I encourage you to rewatch uh, the uh, talk with Ted Hope uh, we had yesterday. I'm not sure you are in competition with uh, the streamers because I think there are a couple of niches which are actually not more niches anymore, uh, where you can uh, touch really a passionate audience and, and go actually beyond and make a good share uh, of, of the cake, also economically speaking, so to speak. And um, yeah, so uh, rewatch this maybe if you like. I love the fact that you bring for the first time today the word quota. And I'm going back to Donald to ask also this question about uh, mainstreaming diversity or diversity city washing to finish this panel um, and um, maybe we should explore the system from within if there is a, a, a diversity a wish to, to to look for more diversity and uh, but anyway D Donald please tell us uh, your take on this this is great and I wish we could have done this in person you know I, I want to say that you know with the other panelists I'm always um, really inspired by by those pushing forward and young leadership I think that has been Really, I think one of the takeaways of the last two years is there's a, there's a sea of change, generationally, I believe, culturally, that our field is uh, experiencing now. That 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 again is just very exciting. Uh, you know, uh, institutions, companies, I think, uh, may view a lot of this work as trends, and and their commitment will always be incremental. I think from the context of the creatives and leaders, we have to figure out. How to structurally so 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 I think for from my vantage point, how do you challenge and keep moving institutions forward to not solely be incremental, but the inverse of that is for leaderships for new leaders and creatives, how can you structure these movements and these efforts and these actions so it doesn't so, so our communities can continue to move forward and create work right I think there's this the, 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 these infrastructure questions of how you, you see how many creatives really burden how to innovate and think differently and create on top of you know a, a very classist you know resource heavy industry right so I think it's these events like these are important figuring out new models of support for those who are leading the charge um, and we have to have you know, ambitious long-term plans that really, I think, hopefully uh, take on the challenges. So this is structure change as opposed to, you know, perceived trends. Absolutely. Fantastic words to finish this panel on taking on power. I think we have here uh, people working on it. So thank you so much, Faraz, Roisin, Donald, to have been with me. And I would say the conversation uh, said it can, can never even be completed here on the conference anyway. We have a special chat um, reconnect session just after. So maybe you want to go there and also connect further with the community here um, uh, in Copenhagen, or oh, in in the mentally in Copenhagen, at any case. So that that is fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful that you were with me here uh, today, um, nearly in the studio. And uh, I will see you later in special chat. I hope.